Continuing on from the last lecture where we were basically focusing on chapter four of CLRS. And we are focusing primarily on the divide and conquer uh, design paradigm, where we're taking a large problem, trying to break it up into smaller problems. And those pro smaller problems have to be similar, essentially similar to the bigger problem, but must be smaller, clearly. And then we said, well, in a lot of cases, you get a recurrence uh, relation, a recurrence equation, as you, you saw in merge sort. And uh, the question was, how do we solve the recurrence relations? And we uh, started looking at the substitution method. Uh, we also looked at the recurrence, recurrence trees. And today we're going to look at two methods in detail, the substitution method and what is referred to as the master method, okay? So this is uh, some of the reviews from the last slide, in the last lecture. Um, and so this was our analysis of merge sort where the recurrence relations that we, that we finally found were that T of N is, for N is equal to one is state of N. And for N greater than N, greater than one, it's the following equation where you have two times T and upon two. So it's dividing the problem into two smaller part, into uh, two smaller parts, and each one of them are also half the original size. And then there is some um, some uh, you know work that has to be done to divide and recombine the results, and that's referred to as F of n. Uh, and we found out that uh, F of n for the merge sort is uh, theta of n, so some constant time n. Um, and then we looked at the, the recursion tree method, where we saw that we could actually draw a recursive tree. And um, make sure this keeps coming back up. Um, and so we we saw that the the recursive the recursion tree has a height of log to the base two of n. And some of you were confused as to why we have this extra CN. Well, uh, remember uh, when you studied hopefully comp 210, uh, when, whenever we have a tree, the height of the tree is measured in the number of edges. Okay, so for example, if you have height of tree, which is something like this, then the height is uh, two because there are two edges, but the number of levels or the number of vertices is actually one plus the number of the height, okay? And so uh, the actual multiplication is C of N, which is the same cost to divide and recombine at every level, but there are log N plus uh, log to the base two of N plus one, uh, the height plus one times uh, CN. Okay, and that's why you had the addition CN. Um, so let's take a look at the substitution method which we started off. And basically the idea was that we're going to guess common solution, okay? And sometimes actually the, the, recurs the recursion tree comes in handy for making a guess. So if you have no idea um, what your guess should be, uh, you might sort of attempt at creating a, a, a tree, a recursion tree, and to be able to see, well, can you get, uh, uh, you know, can you make a reasonable guess? And perhaps if you've done enough of recursion trees, you'll be able to guess uh, reasonably closely as to what uh, should be the approximate um, you know, complexity of the algorithm. And then we'll use mathematical induction. And I'm presuming that all of you have done quite a few uh, inductions in some of the other math courses uh, that you had to, that were prerequisites for this course. But nevertheless, uh, even though you may have done induction a uh, fair amount, sometimes it can be confusing, okay? And in particular, uh, in this um, particular, um, you know, in the examples that we, we're going to be looking at, um, I would like you to pay a particular attention, uh, even though you may know, you know uh, the induction method quite well, but you can get confused. And that's why I'm going to look at several examples today to be able to show you, um, you know, the kinds of issues that you could come across. So we started off in, in the last lecture by looking at this particular example. Um, see. I want to make sure that this doesn't keep on coming back up. Why it keeps back up? But uh, let's take a look at this example. And so uh, we have the following following recurrence, uh, uh, recurrence relation. 
which we've already seen, which is essentially that of the bird sort. And um, we're making an incorrect guess to show you, uh, you know, the, not all guesses will be correct. So let's make an incorrect guess that uh, this is uh, T of N is order big O of N. And we know that that's not true because we know that it is uh, big O of N log N. Okay, but let's try to see what happens if you make that guess. So if you guess that T of N is equal to big O of N, then naturally directly from, uh, you know, the definition that implies that T of N is less than or equal to some C um, times N, okay, for some C. But since we have another C over here, so we need to use different variables because they don't have to be the same, okay? So I'm going to use C1 over here and C over here to differentiate it from the earlier C. And we're going to say for that, um, we're going to make the, the guess that um, T of N is equal to big O of N, which implies that T of N has to be less than or equal to C1 of N for some C1 greater than zero and for all uh, N greater than some N naught. Okay, as n goes to infinity, this has to be true. So um, the, the induction uh, method uh, clearly has a base case, as uh, we all know. Then we're going to start with the base case for n is equal to one. And we're going to say, well, what happens uh, when n is equal to one? We have, we already know what t of n is. And so we have a t of n being one. And the question is, is that less than equal to uh, the the guess that we have, the induction hypothesis, which is uh, not not the induction hypothesis yet, but the guess that we have, which is C1 times N, okay? And that is clearly true uh, if C1 is greater than or equal to one. Uh, now we need to form the induction hypothesis, okay? So, and that's a little different from the guess because now we have to choose uh, certain ranges of, uh, of, uh, of N, for which we assume that the induction hypothesis is true. And then we're going to try to see if that is the case, um, then can we prove it for, um, you know, as n becomes larger. So I'm going to uh, make a change of variables. So I'm going to say, well, let's assume that for m less than n, okay? For m less than n, we're going to assume uh, that our guess is true, which is that T of m is less than equal to C1 times m. Okay, and now uh, based on this fact, we have to prove uh, if this is the if our guess is correct that t of n as opposed to m is less than or equal to c one of c one times n. Okay, so this has to be proven. Um, for we assumed m is less than n, and now we have to prove that this is true for the value of n as well. Okay, for m is equal to n. Let's say. So how do we go about this? Um, well, we start off with saying, well, we, we try to prove this, the Tn is less than or equal to C1 of n. So we have, we already have an, an equation for T of n, and that's given as part of our recurrence relation. So we know that T of n is equal to uh, two times Tn upon two plus Cn directly from here. Okay, so this is coming directly from here. Um, and this is equation one, all right? And from our induction hypothesis, so we have uh, Tn is now being given as two times some smaller value of T of n, okay? But this smaller value will have um, n upon two is clearly less than n, okay? So uh, we can now use our induction hypothesis over here, okay? Uh, so our induction hypothesis is saying that if uh, m is less than n, then this is true, okay? And we can clearly see that n upon two is less than n. So we can use this over here, uh, the second uh, equation. And we can say that T of n is less than equal to, and now we're going to uh, replace T upon two with, uh, with our induction hypothesis. So two times C1 times n upon two plus Cn. Uh, so this is going to be true based directly from our second equation equation number two, okay? And so if that is the case, uh, then we have the following relationship T of N, which is essentially the left-hand side of this equation is less than or equal to C1N plus CN, okay? So we have two different constants, a C1 and a C. Now we basically have to prove that this, the left-hand side is now less than or equal to 
C1 times N, okay? And so uh, you can see that we've, we've got something in which we have C1N on both the left-hand side as well as the right-hand side. But in addition, we also have some additional value function of N on the left-hand side. And so the question is, is this going to be true? Okay, hopefully that should, uh, should be uh, not too difficult. And you can see that clearly this is not going to be true because we already know that C is uh, a positive constant. Well, um, it doesn't necessarily. So, so, so let me open up the question. Um, when is this not, uh, is going to be true? And, and can you think of situations where this is going to be true? So can we show that T of N is going to be less than or equal to C1N? What would be the conditions? Uh, we already have a condition for C1, which has to be greater than zero. But do we really have a condition for Cn? Do we have a condition for C uh, for, for the value of C, in other words? So far, do you have a con condition for the value of C? And can you think of values of C for which this particular equation uh, C1n plus Cn is in fact going to be less than C1n? Okay. When is that going to be true? Yeah. Okay, so very good. So, um, so it seems like um, we've just proven that T of N is big O of N. All you have to do is have C less than or equal to zero. So is this all making sense? And earlier we said, well, we said that it's going to be n log n, right? This is what we were expecting. This was the case directly coming out from a real, uh, not a mathematical construct, but it was coming out from a real algorithm, which was merge sort, okay? So what's going wrong over here? What's going wrong? So can you apply this to merge sort and tell me what's going wrong? Yeah. Yeah, so essentially we saying that C has to be positive. So why is C positive in merge sort? Think back to merge sort. And I don't know if he said that explicitly, that C has to be positive. So let's go back to merge sort. Okay. So why can't this be minus Cn over here? But that makes sense for merge sort. Or even for C is equal to zero. That makes sense. Yeah. So, so what you're saying is that for this particular example in merge sort, C has to be positive. I mean, C equal to zero is not making sense, right? And C less than zero is also not making sense. Just by looking at merge sort, we know that you know th this has to be some additional work. You can't be saying, well, there's actually some, you know, you can't be subtracting work, right? And similarly, C has to be greater than zero uh, because you know you have a matrix and that's being copied and it's going to take some positive value, right? So naturally. Um, sometimes we uh, we lose sight when we're just looking at the math of it. We lose sight of um, of how it relates to a, a real problem, and we'll, we say, "Well, this is true as long as c is less than or equal to zero." But then you go back to a real problem, and you realize that c has to be positive. Okay, so uh, that's not going to happen. All right, and even for c is equal to zero, this uh, the, this is relationship is not going to be true. Um, so this is only true if C is actually positive, okay? That you having some extra effort in merge sort to actually combine the results or to divide up the work, okay? If there was no additional work, then in fact, it would not be order of n log n, yes. In merge sort, okay? So going back to merge sort, um, we, we're basically saying, well, uh, this is, you know, we, we've divide, we're dividing up the problem 
into two smaller problems. So I don't know if I have those other slides. Yeah, so if, I, if you look at this, we're essentially saying that we're dividing up the problem into two smaller problems, okay? And that's where two times T and upon two comes, all right? We're dividing it up into two problems, each of them being half in size, and then we also have to merge, okay? So we have to, so that merge, uh, and then we, we, you know, you remember in the last lecture, we spent some time figuring out what is the complexity of merge sort, okay? And we said that, well, we have to do these operations and these, and then there's this loop, and all of these are essentially, all of them are theta of n, okay? So there's some constant in n, okay? Um, so, so your question is, uh, why, if it's C of N, why is it big theta of N? Is your question focused on oh, C on, uh, why is it even C of N, C times N, or why is it specifically theta of N? Okay, so, so, so why is it specifically C times N? Well, um, if, you look at, if you look at what's going on over here, okay, you're doing a series of operations from one to a constant number, Okay, which is half the value of n. Okay, and each one of these is a, is a constant, let's say, a constant time to actually compute that. Okay, uh, and then you, and so this one would be something like c n upon two, all right, so for some value of c. Okay, and you know that c n upon two from our earlier lectures, you know that that is essentially theta of n. Okay, so. Uh, so hopefully everybody can see that, okay? So now um, going forward again, where we stopped, uh, we can see that um, this, is, this equation is not going to be true for as long as C is greater than uh, zero, okay? And N is, we've already defined that N has to be greater than uh, one or greater than zero, okay? So this condition is not gonna be true and our induction hypothesis fails, okay? So we can essentially say that this is not true, that T of N is not big O of N, we've just disproved that. So let's go on and make a more intelligent hypothesis. And, um, and this is just the working which I've already done. So uh, let's now go on. Okay, there's a question over here, I believe. But let's go on to another example uh, where we're saying that um, we're now assuming making a much more uh, logical guess, which is that T of N is big O of N log N. Okay, and we hopefully got that from our, from our equation tree. Um, so uh, based on the definition, of big O, we now know that T of N is, has to be some, has to be less than or equal to some C2 times N log N, and I'm now using a different constant over here, C2, not using C1, the reason for that. And, um, and now what we have to uh, essentially say is that for some C2 greater than zero and for all N greater than or equal to N2, uh, we want to be able to use this and we go through the induction process, okay? So we check the base case, uh, is this going to be true for the base case? So we have uh, T of N on the left-hand side uh, is one from here, okay? Is this less than equal to some C2 times one and has value of one and then log of one, is this true? Is it true? What's log of one? Zero, yeah, so, so, so this is a, a trick. So this is an issue, this is zero, and so one is not less than e equal to zero. So it's not, it doesn't hold for the very uh, starting point of our base case. So we go on for a larger value of N. So we take N is equal to two, and we can see that this is in fact true uh, if C2 has to be greater than equal to C plus one. Okay, so, so just going through this, we essentially replaced N is equal to two over here. So uh, you have uh, on, uh, so, so how do we get, what's the value of T of N? We'll use this um, recurrence relation and we'll say, well, T of two uh, 
uh, is two times T of one, which we already know is one, plus uh, C times N, which is two over here, is that less than equal to uh, this part over here? And we're saying C two times two log of two. Okay, we do some uh, cross out the twos, log of two is one. So essentially are saying C plus one has to be less than equal to, C plus one has to be less than equal to uh, C two because uh, two log, log two is, is one. Remember that whenever we, we say LG, we are implying log to the base two. Okay, so this is log to the base of two. Um, and so um, the condition is C2 has to, has to be greater than or equal to C plus one, okay? Um, so now let's go forward with, we found the base case where this does hold and now we need to uh, make our induction hypothesis. Um, we'll make the same induction hypothesis as earlier. Uh, we'll say that T of M is less than or equal to C2 times m log m, because now we have uh, our, our guess is n log n. So now we're saying uh, m log m, and we're saying this is true for all values of m less than m, okay? Uh, and now if this is true, then we need to prove that this also holds for um, a larger value, which is the case of uh, m equal to n, or in other words, t of n has to be shown to be less than or equal to C2 n log n. Okay, so here remember that you've taken M less than M. Okay, we're making this hypothesis. Now we're saying that if this is true, then based on the recurrence relation, uh, can we prove this? Okay, so far so good. Um, and then we do something very similar to what we did in, in the previous uh, uh, example. We just plug in the values. So we have, uh, we, we're trying to prove this equation. Okay, so we have a left-hand side and we have a right-hand side. Okay, so first we'll work with the left-hand side and the left-hand side of that equation, T of N, we know from the recurrence relation is given by uh, the following. Okay, and now um, because it has a value of T of a smaller value inside here, Okay, so um, we know that n upon two is going to be less than n, all right? So clearly, if this particular condition holds uh, on this particular uh, t of n upon two, okay? So we can now use the induction hypothesis over here. And so we say two times and we plug in the value over here, C2m, and now m is n upon two, okay? Uh, log of, uh, n upon two, and and this the rest of the equation comes out from here. So now uh, we have to if we simply go forward and we we try to work this out, not too difficult, just a bunch of algebra. We have um, two and two cross out over here, and we know that um, this can be represented as log of n minus log of two. Log of two is one. Okay, so we basically have C2N. Now we're getting something which is looking like the right-hand side. Okay. So, um, yeah, so this was our left-hand side. This is left-hand side, and this is our right-hand side. And so we're getting uh, the left-hand side to look somewhat similar to the right-hand side. So you can see that C2n log n has shown up over here, but we do have some additional terms. Where are those additional terms coming from? So we have C2n multiplied by minus one, okay? And then we have the leftover from, um, from the original equation, okay? So now the question is, is this less than or equal to C2n log n, which was what we were trying to prove? Okay, and what, and if so, then what would be the condition on C2? Yeah. So it needs to be greater than or equal to C. Okay, fairly straightforward. Why is that? Because if it's greater than or equal to C, then this particular 
term over here is going to be positive, which means that the left-hand side is going to be a smaller value. And if it's a smaller value, then clearly it's going to be uh, less than equal to uh, this value over here. Okay, so, so, so far, uh, great. So we've been able to show that this hypothesis will hold because C2, all C2 has to be is greater than or equal to C. So um, remember um, when, when we said, um, when, when we said that T of N is big O of N log N, um, all we said was C2 has to be some value greater than zero, okay? And uh, here we've got some value over here C. And as long as we make C2 greater than or equal to C, then, then this uh, induction hypothesis is true. And can we do that? Yeah, clearly, because we can take any value of C, any value of C2, and given the particular value of C, we'll just make C2 bigger than C. Okay, so let's say merge sort gives C to be a million, we take C to be bigger than that, C2 to, to be bigger than a million, okay? And what is the condition on N? What's the condition on N? What does it have to be bigger than? Zero? Greater than or equal to one? Greater than or equal to two, right? Why is that? Because the base case of one failed, and so the minimum value of N for which this, satis this satisfied the base case starts from two. Okay, so, so essentially this is what we have is that C2 plus has to be greater than or equal to C plus one, okay? And N has to be greater than two, all right? So, um, so great, uh, we've been able to prove that uh, T of N is in fact um, big O of N log N. That was somewhat of a relief because we knew that was already true. So now um, you might say, well, that's great, but can we actually prove that it is also um, theta of n log n? Okay, can we prove that t of n is theta of big theta of n log n? And for that, what would we have to do? So this is not sufficient. Is part of the proof, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so if we can prove that P of N is equal to, uh, or is a part of the set omega N log N, then we can essentially, from our earlier theorem 3.1, we know that both of those conditions will ensure that P of N is big theta as well, okay? So now let's go on and try to prove uh, the following, whether T of N is, uh, is big omega or N log N. And this is essentially fairly similar in the initial parts. Uh, all that's being done is uh, we are reversing the condition. So now T of N has to be bigger than some C1 N log N. Earlier, uh, C1 or C2 N log N was smaller than T of N, but now the condition has reversed. And so, um, uh, you can fairly simply see that, well, if is it true for the base case? Well, it, it is apparently true because one is less than equal to C1 times um, one log one, which is zero. So one is always greater than or equal to zero. So that's fine. Um, and then our induction hypothesis is fairly similar to the uh, previous case, except that now the conditions are changed. And um, I'm not going to bore you with all of this. But essentially, we, we do the same thing. We take out, uh, equate, we use equation one, and then we have our induction hypothesis, which has a different sign. Um, and we, we get, I think you should be able to get this far. Okay, so that's just a bunch of algebra. And now the question is, uh, is this greater than or equal to the right-hand side? Okay, so this was the left-hand side. This was the right-hand side. Uh, we've shown that the left-hand side is greater than or equal to this, okay? And so is this greater than or equal to the right-hand side, which is C1n log of n, okay? And what would be the condition on C1 for this to be true? Somebody else? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> 
Yeah. So C1 has to be less than or equal to C. Okay. Uh, if that is the case, then uh, C minus C1 is going to be a positive number. And if that is positive, then clearly this number, the this number being positive will ensure that this whole expression is actually because we've got you know, this part of the equation is the same. So this will ensure that uh, this condition holds true. So we have C1 less than equal to C. And what's the condition on N? Greater than equal to one, yeah. Okay, because we have the base case, N is equal to one, that is, that is correct. So we have uh, C1 has to be, now C1 has to be less than or equal to C, as we just saw. Um, but we also have the condition that C1 is greater than zero, okay? So if you remember from the basic definition of T of N, we said that T, Tn has to be greater than or equal to some C1, which is where C1 is greater than zero. Okay, so C1 has to be positive for us to be able to uh, show that T of n is big omega. Okay, as was the case for C2. Okay, they all have to be some positive constants. They can't be zero uh, or they can't be negative. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It could be any, any, any real numbers. Okay. So, um, so C1, uh, the fact that C1 has to be greater than zero, Okay, which is coming out from, from this part over here, uh, from the definition of big omega, implies that C also has to be now greater than equal to zero. Okay, or, or actually strictly greater than zero. Okay, so in this case, uh, we're saying that C has to be positive. Um, and so the, now the condition becomes uh, N is greater than or equal to one. Okay, it comes out from the base case and C1, uh, has to be less than or equal to C, and C1 also has to be greater than zero. So this becomes the condition for the, the hypothesis, which is the guess was that T of N is also big omega of N log N, okay? So now we've proven both of those requirements, and essentially what that, you know, from, from th both of those and theorem 3.1, we can now say that T of N is now Big meg, uh, big theta of um, big, big theta of n log n. Okay. Now the only thing that is left is for us to actually prove for what are the values. Okay. So what are the values requirements for uh, C one and C two? So earlier we we've already seen initially that uh, C two had the requirement that it has to be greater than or equal to C one plus C plus one. And the requirement on N was that it has to be greater than N2, which was two, okay? In example three, we saw that for Tn to be big omega of N log N, then C1 has to be less than or equal to C, and N has to be greater than um, N1, which is one. So now what are the final conditions? Can somebody tell me what those would be? So what are the conditions on C1, C2, and on N. So C1 and C2 are kind of straightforward. They're just coming up directly from here, okay? Uh, these, uh, because C1 and C2 are two different numbers. Um, and, and so they um, they have their individual condition, but what about N? Yeah. Yeah. So N has to be, because remember uh, N, uh, this, it has to satisfy both of these conditions, okay? It's the same N. C1 and C2 are different, but the N is the same. And N1, N has to satisfy both of these conditions, which is max of N1 and N2, and that uh, clearly is two, okay? So this becomes the following requirement for T of N to be big theta of N log N, all right? So uh, using induction, uh, you can, it's it's a it's a great technique actually, um, and if you if you get this under your belt, then it comes really handy, uh, and it's actually a lot of fun as well. Okay, so so you can try out different examples, and and here's another sort of a fun example. Okay, well we know that t of n is 
big theta of n, but can you also show that t of n is big O of you know some higher order of n, some uh, some higher polynomial in n? Okay. So this should naturally be true, right? Simply because we know that uh, t of n is big O of n log n, then we can pick, uh, we can also should, should be able to show that it's n cube, it's order of n cube or order of n to the power infinity as well, you know, or something like that, some crazy thing like that. Okay, so, so let's see if that's true. And that should be again, something fairly straightforward. All we have to do is use the same technique earlier. And if you follow this technique, then you should be able to see that, you know, now what are we doing? Uh, we're saying, well, we're taking the left-hand side again and the right-hand side. So the left-hand side comes out to be from the induction hypothesis. It comes out to be two times C2. And now uh, it's a little easier because our induction hypothesis is fairly loose. Okay, sort of a loose upper bound as opposed to a tight upper bound. Okay, so, um, so and, I, and I want to emphasize sometimes uh, we get, we do get confused by what is a tight upper bound and what is a loose upper bound. Okay, so for example, if here is an equation and you have, um, uh, you have two separate equations, now this could be a tight upper bound on this and this could be a loose upper bound. Okay. Similarly, this could be a tight lower bound, and this could be a loose lower bound. Okay. So, so uh, we're going to be using those terms, and um, hopefully, you understand those. So, this is sort of now uh, we're trying to prove a really loose upper bound. That should be easy. So, we're saying that uh, two times t, uh, and now we're going to replace that. Uh, with C2M squared. So that comes out to be, hopefully you can see that. And um, now the condition over here comes out to be fairly straightforward and you can just try that out, okay? So anyway, uh, so those were some examples uh, of induction hypothesis and, um, and there's going to be, uh, you should be able to find a lot of examples that you might want to work out so that you can get that under your belt. Um, take a look at some examples from CLRS. Uh, there's a whole bunch of examples. There's a bunch of examples which are worked out as well. As I said, there are solutions available and make sure that you understand all of those, okay? So now let's go on to the next major topic, uh, which is trying to use uh, a technique, which is sort of a, a cookbook solution, okay? And, and that comes in really handy because, you know, if why, why use uh, recursion tree? Why use um, you know, the induction method if you've actually got a cookbook solution, okay? And, all the, and the master method simply says, well, if this is the form of the recur recurrence relation, then here's the answer. It's almost like a lookup table, okay? But it's also important to be able to understand, okay? So sometimes people present this in the form that, you know, here, here's a solution, just look it up and, and you know th that's the answer. But I would like to stress that you need to be able to understand this as well, okay? Not from a completely theoretical proof point of view, but from an intuitive point of view, okay? So a lot of times uh, intuition, uh, and I think this is true for generally for most things in life, that you must have an intuition, okay? So if, you, if you're a computer scientist, if you're an engineer, especially if you're an engineer, you must have an intuition for what you're trying to do, okay? And you might be able to prove something and at the end of it, if you look at it and you say, well, my intuitive sense is saying, this is not right, uh, then you should go back and check it out. Okay, so, so always make sure that you do have an intuition for whatever results or whatever problem that you're working on. And if you don't have an intuition for that, then there's a problem, okay? Then, then you're simply trying to memorize certain things and that won't last very long, okay? so. Six months down the road, a year, definitely by the time you graduate, you won't remember these equations. But if you have an intuitive sense of what's going on, hopefully that will stay with you. Okay. So let's try to understand the master theor theorem from, from an intu intuitive point of view, as well as from the actual rigorous point of view as well. Okay. So the master theorem uh, is the following, and this is uh, 
the conditions it imposes on your recurrence uh, relation. It says that if you have the recurrence relation in this form and only this form, okay? In other words, you have T of N, A, T, and you have constants A and B, and you have some F of N, which is asymptotically positive. What does that mean? Simply means that as N goes to infinity, it's a positive number, okay? And that's our general assumption that's not becoming negative. Uh, you can think of some polynomial equations, uh, you know, if, it, if the highest power in N happens to be negative, then it's actually uh, not asymptotically positive. Okay, so these are the conditions that you're going to be working with and A and B are, are positive. So um, let me give you an equation. Let's say that T of N is equal to uh, five T N of three plus C N. Does this satisfy the equation? And um, what's, and hopefully this is trivial for you to figure out that A is five and B is three. In other words, you've taken the problem, you've divided it up into um, five smaller problems. So this is telling you how many sub problems do you have? Okay. And this is telling you how big are those individual sub problems? Okay. So is this, a good equation or not? I mean, would you would you want to use this equation? Would you want to use this algorithm? If I said that, you know, this is how I'm dividing it up. Um, I'm using a new merge sort, and this is what the recurrence relation is. Is that, would you want to follow this algorithm? Why not? Yeah, you're making more work. Why? Because you're dividing it up into uh, one third, dividing up the problem into, into one third, but then there are five such problems to be solved, okay? So that's not good. Um, on the other hand, if five was replaced with a, with a three, um, that may or may not be good, okay? Which you've already seen, that's what merge sort does. And when would that be the case? Uh, in earlier merge sort, we had two over here and two here. In other words, we were dividing up the problem into two equally, uh, two roughly equal parts, and we divide them up into two such problems, okay? But that doesn't have, have to be the case. So you could have, for example, three over here, three and three, which would sort of be, uh, you know, essentially merge sort again, because all you're doing is now, you're taking the original problem, you're dividing it up into not two, but three pro smaller problems, and now you have three of those, okay? And we'll see uh, examples of these as we go forward. Um, so what if we had an equation, something like this, um, 3t um, square root, square root n plus c of n, would you be able to apply master, master method to this? So it's breaking up into three smaller problems. And each one of those problems is actually the square root of the original. So can you apply the master method to this? No, clearly not because it simply just doesn't have the, the format. We, we wanted to have constants A and B and this is, you know, you're taking a square root, so you can't apply. So the master method will not always work, but it will work if you have the following uh, format. So now let's take a look at the example that we're already familiar with. Okay, so this was the case that we've, we've already worked with and um, you have, um, so let's say this is an example of n is equal to eight, a is equal to two and b is equal to two. So we've, we've got the original problem, which is of size n is equal to eight and we've taken um, um, a to be two and B to be two. So in other words, we're dividing up just in, like in word sort, we've divided up into two smaller problems and each one of them are of the same size and so on. And we get all the way till the end. And uh, hopefully you can see that we get something like the height of the tree, which was uh, log, okay, plus one times the constant HC, okay? So this can sort of be written in the following form. All right, trouble keeping all of these additional things which keep popping up. 
uh, you can sort of summarize this in the following way that if the hardness of the problem, as you're dividing up the problem, if the hardness, the difficulty level of that problem is being maintained in the smaller problems, okay? Um, and, and so if the hardness is evenly distributed, okay, then all, relevant, all of those um, levels are actually relevant. In other words, uh, if, you, if you, the original problem was of size HC, okay, now you have two smaller problems, each one of them being of size C and upon two. So it's two times uh, HC upon two, which again is HC and so on. So all the way down to the bottom of the recursion tree, the problem is being divided up into problems which are all of the, uh, uh, you know, are roughly the same size, okay, are, are exactly the same size. So HC, 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 uh, it keeps on going down, okay? So if that is the case, then, um, the master method refers to this as case two, where the cases can be jumbled up, but I'm going to be referred to, to this as case two because that's how CLRS refers to it, all right? So the example of merge sort comes out to be case two, and it sort of can be summarized in the following way, and, and that's sort of giving you the intuitive sense, that if the hardness is evenly distributed, at, then all levels are relevant, okay? So all of these levels are relevant to the solution of the problem, Okay, and so uh, the the Tn becomes the height. So we have the height of this. Okay, multiplied by any one of those levels because they're all the same. And so now uh, it becomes the height of this is. Uh, and hopefully you can see that this is not just uh, log of anything. It's log to the base b. Okay, so so far we had b is equal to two. So that's why we had simply referred to this as log. Um, n or log to the base two of n, okay? But uh, in other examples, you'll see that b can be different. And so you have to pick the base the base of, uh, of, of this log in the appropriate way so that the tree's height is calculated correctly. So uh, we're going to take the height times some level. The height we know is log to the base b of n, okay, times some level. And that level uh, can be uh, seen to be uh, n to the power log to the base b of a. Okay, so so let's see if that that makes sense. Uh, in this particular case, uh, this equation is going to be uh, an extremely important part of the master method. Okay, and this is also referred to as the watershed uh, uh, equation. So uh, what is log b log log to the base b of a? Well, in this case, clearly it's log to the base two of two, which is com which comes out to be one. Okay. So you have um, uh, this part coming out to be n to the power of one, okay? So your overall uh, complexity becomes theta um, n log n, okay? Let's reverse the order, okay? So, so you can see that uh, the master method uh, does give you a slightly more complex solution, okay? but it does fit into our earlier example that was of merge sort, right? And as you take a look at more and more examples, you'll see that um, why is this uh, a little bit more uh, complex? So um, now let's take a look at another case. And I'm going to call this case three, okay? And here now what we have is, um, so we have A is equal to two, and b is equal to three. In other words, we have the, the case where you're taking the problem, you're dividing up to two smaller problems, but each one of those smaller problems is not just half, but it's actually one third. Okay. So is this a nice algorithm? Is this better than merge sort? Yeah, this seems to be better than merge sort. Why? Because now not only have we divided up into the same number of smaller problems, but each one of those problems actually only one third. Okay. So if you if you think about how is the problem changing as you divide it, is it becoming this? Is it the same? Is it becoming harder? Or is it becoming simpler? Is it, it seems to be becoming simpler, right? So it's becoming simpler. 
So we essentially saying that in this particular case, let's try to work out uh, what would be the, reco the recursion tree. So if you had CN over here, uh, how many parts are we going to divide it up into? Three or two? Sorry? So we're dividing up into how many parts? It's gonna be two or three? Three? Sorry? Sorry? Should be three? Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to confuse you guys. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so it's, uh, so the, that was a question, right? So it's not going to be three, it's going to be two. So why? Because we're breaking it up into a number of smaller parts. Okay, so you're right. Some people got confused. Okay, so this is going to be divided up into two smaller parts, not three. Okay, and each one of those is going to be how big? Is going to be C n upon two or upon n upon three. It's going to be now n upon three. Okay, so uh, so now it's going to be C n upon three, and this is going to be C n upon three. So now you divide up into two smaller problems, but now they are not; they are actually smaller than what we saw in word sort. Okay, so now what's this uh, expression going to be over here? Can somebody give me an expression for that. Two thirds n, okay, times c. Yeah, because you basically take two times c n upon three. Okay, so far so good. That comes out to be what? So n is 27, 27 upon three is nine times two, so that comes out to be 18 c. Okay, so now, uh, and if you keep on working, let's do just one more level. So what is the, the next equation going to be? And somebody give me an equation for the next level. And this is going to be C n upon, n upon nine, yeah. So each one of those levels is going to be C n upon nine. And so what's the equation for this? Four times, C uh, n upon nine, and that comes out to be um, n is 27 over here in this example. So that comes out to be 12 C if I'm not mistaken. Okay. So what you can see is that um, in this particular case, the problem is actually becoming smaller as you're going forward. Okay. So all the levels are of not are not of the same complexity or not as difficult, okay? So essentially as in this, in this particular example, um, as you're going downwards, you're essentially making the problem smaller, okay? So uh, we have 27C, 18C, 12C, and 88C, okay? And so um, in this particular case, uh, what the uh, master's theorem basically says is that if the problem is getting easier, then essentially what we're saying is that this, the root level is actually the hardest, which is kind of obvious by now, right? So this is the most hardest and this becomes easier and easier and easier, okay? So now you can't just take the height of the tree and multiply it by each one of these because now these are becoming smaller, okay? And so uh, in this particular case, the solution is actually going to be theta of f of n. Okay, and this was what our f of n was, remember? So does this make sense? And can somebody tell me why it makes intuitive sense? What's your intuition telling you? Why, why is this, uh, why does the master method, I mean, we're not proving it, but we're essentially saying, is there an intuition behind the method? Why, why is, why are we sort of neglecting the rest of it? Yes. You have to speak up a little bit. Yeah, so that's one way of thinking about it, great. So you basically have, this is the highest order 
and you have lower orders of complexity, and so you're going to neglect those. Okay, and so now, so this uh, the highest order of complexity comes out to be right at the top level, and that's where you actually break about to break up the problem. Okay, or you re recombining the problem. Okay, so hopefully this should uh, now be intuitively obvious to you that this sort of makes sense. Okay, may not completely agree with it, but at least it's going in the right direction. Okay, so this was case three. And, and so far, we still don't have an exact statement of, the, uh, of, of, uh, of this theorem, of the master theorem. We just sort of, sort of building up to it, okay? And uh, as we go forward, we'll have the exact um, relationships. Um, now let's take a look at the third case, which is called case one, okay? And now in this particular case, I've taken A is equal to three and B is equal to two. So now I'm dividing it up into three smaller parts and each one of them are going to be, so in this particular case, now how many levels are we going to have over here? We're going to be breaking it up into three smaller parts and each one of them is going to be half the size, okay? So now that should be C, N upon two, and now there are going to be three of those. So can somebody tell me the equations over here? So let's assume that this is eight C, what is this going to be? Three, C, N upon two, okay? And that comes out if uh, N is equal to eight, what does that come out to be? 12 C, okay? And you can see that eight C now it's becoming more complex at every level simply because now you're breaking it up into three smaller problems and each one of those are only half as big, okay? So that's not a good algorithm. Uh, definitely not uh, as good as merge sort. And so if you keep on going, the next level would be again, uh, what would be an equation for this? So now we're breaking it up into three more. And this would be C and upon, and upon four, all right. And now how many of these levels do we have? So what's the equation? So it would be nine times C and upon four, and so that can be seen to be 18. So we have our 8C, 12C, 18C, so sort of becoming bigger and bigger, okay? And so uh, in this particular case, um, the master method basically says that if the problem gets harder, then the leaves are the hardest, okay? Because this was 8C, this becomes 12C, 18C, 27C. So clearly you can see that the actual work, and there are algorithms which do this, so it's not just a fictitious example. Uh, there are algorithms which will uh, divide and conquer, but ultimately uh, the real complexity will be right at the bottom. Okay, when you get to the leaves, that's where the, the complexity will be. And so, as you can see, that in this particular case, uh, the, the complexity is the amount of work that is done by the leaves. Okay, not that by the root, but the amount of work that is being done by the leaves. And so we've already seen this expression before that, ca that can be shown to be n to the power log to the base P of A, okay? Again, uh, you can work this out and you can see in this particular example, it's not so trivial. So you have log to the base of uh, three, okay? Log to the base uh, two of three, which comes out to be 1.58, okay? So the order of complexity over here, is order uh, is theta of n to the power of 1.58, okay? So you've got, so you can see that the Marsh method is really powerful. I mean, it's giving you just, uh, you know, directly from the recurrence relation, you're coming up with an exact expression for the theta complexity. And you, you can express this exactly. So it's n to the power 1.58 or, you know, whatever that log to base uh, two of three is, okay? So, um, so that's uh, the beauty of the master method uh, when you can apply it. And, and so this is sort of uh, expresses the, the master method and essentially in a more complex situation, so far we had F of N being fairly straightforward, okay? F of N was simply C of, C of N. And we're essentially saying that uh, when, you, when you're computing log to the base B of A, notice that in this case, it is higher than the power of F of M. 
Okay. So in this case, n goes to the power one. Okay. And the octet base B of A is higher than one. Okay. In the earlier case, um, I didn't show this to you, but if you take log to the base three of two, it comes out to be smaller than one. Okay. So uh, this is coming out to be smaller than the, uh, the order of complexity of f of m, which is n to the power of one. Okay. So 0.63 is less than one. So essentially what we're doing is, and, and f of n doesn't always have to be theta of n. Okay. F of n could be something more complex. It could be theta of n squared. So the question is, what happens then? Okay. So in that situation, basically what you have to do is you have to take log to the base uh, log L O G to the base B of A, and you have to compare it with the power of n over here. Okay. You have to compare it with this particular term. So which is what we do. We we're expressing over here is that the master method compares this called the driving function f of n with what is referred to as a watershed function. Okay, so we basically comparing these two functions f of n with n to the power log to the base b of, of a. Okay, and if the watershed function grows polynomially faster than the driving function, first case applies. If uh, if it's the reverse, then case three applies. Okay, the two cases that we've sort of given to you. Now let's work through a number of um, examples. But before we go through a uh, number of examples, let's look at the formal definition of the of the master method. All right, and this you'll find uh, as it refers. This is called the master theorem, which appears in the book. And again, the conditions on on the recurrence relation are the same, which I mentioned earlier. Now you have the following three cases, and these are now expressed in a much more mathematical uh, way. And essentially what you're saying is that if there exists a constant epsilon greater than zero, okay, and f of n is big O of n, this watershed function, but now you have, uh, it's slightly less than this watershed function, okay? So we're comparing it with, with the watershed function and we're saying that uh, the f of n is slightly, is, is polynomially, uh, you know, lower than, the watershed function by a factor of epsilon. Okay, epsilon is greater than zero. In that case, we've already seen that uh, we have theta is equal to n to the power, and all the work is being done at the leaves level, and uh, the number of and, that, and the complexity of that is given by this expression. Okay, and then uh, this, the third case. If you jump to the third case first, uh, is to, is completely opposite, and we're saying that. Uh, and, and there are some slight changes in the, in, the, uh, in the notation. Here, the condition is it has to be big O, and here it's a condition that it has to be big omega, okay? But now what we're saying is that the, um, the driving function is in higher complexity as compared to the water fun watershed function by, uh, by epsilon, okay, in, 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 uh, in the power of n. So as long as epsilon is greater than zero and uh, it's slightly more complex, then you simply have the condition that the complexity is simply given by the, the complexity at the root level, okay? And that was theta of f of n. Um, there is an additional regularity condition and we'll get to that uh, towards the uh, slightly later, but, but that's true for most functions, okay? Uh, let's take a look at the middle condition, which we thought was an easy one, okay? Uh, it is easy if you make k is equal to zero, but for k, it's also applicable for k greater than or equal to zero. So, so let's take a look at this. So it's basically saying that if f of n is theta of not just the, uh, the watershed function, but multiplied by some logarithmic function, okay? And you remember, where is that coming in from? This is the height of the, of the tree, okay? So sometimes you have to multiply, think about it um, when, when k is equal to one, um, then, uh, sorry, when k is equal to zero. Um, so, so sorry, it, it come, it's coming out over here, okay? So think about it when k was equal to zero and f of n was simply equal to log to the base, 
anything to the power zero is is one. So this come you can remove this. And so this was the the uh, merge sort example where theta was n to the power of log to the base p of a, which in that case was one. Okay. And so uh, here basically it's saying that the complexity can be written as n log of n. Okay. So essentially what you're doing is you're taking k and you're incrementing it by one. So uh, um, merge sort, the, 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 the driving function f of n was theta of n. And you saw that the, uh, the complexity was theta of n log n. Okay. And essentially what you did was you incremented the power of the logarithm. Okay, so that can, that can become confusing. What that means is when, uh, so um, is equal to log of n to the power of k. Okay. So you have an interesting question and you, you're going down to the, the actual theorem and you're saying, why is it log to the base two? Good question. Um, so remember that we talked about theta, big theta, okay? Does that give you a hint? What if I change the base of the log? Would that change the, the expression of theta? Sorry, it weren't right because it will simply be off by a constant. You remember your your log, log, log logs, right? So it would simply be off by a constant, and that comes out in the theta expression. So you can just use log to the base two, or you could actually it doesn't have to be log to the base two. It could be any log. Good question. Um, so now you've seen the you've seen the second case as well, and I've sort of simplified it for the scenario where you have. Uh, k is equal to zero, okay? And that's exactly the, the merge sort example. But that can be generalized and you can say, uh, you know, uh, the master theorem gives you a more general expression that says that if k is greater than one, then all you have to do is, this is uh, essentially n log n, but n is now slightly different and this is also slightly different. n is now has to be replaced by n to the power is the watershed function, right? So n to the power log to the base b of a, right? Um, and if you have um, a higher power of log in the f of n function, then you simply have to increment that power of log in the complexity, okay? So um, let's take a look at some examples. We do have a few minutes left. So let's take a look at uh, some examples which will hopefully be able to um, simplify uh, this. So here I've sort of given you in one in one sheet, the, 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 the three scenarios and we can take a look at this uh, later on as well. Okay, we will come back to this. So let's take a look at the first example. And um, here we have um, the case one, okay. And we're essentially saying that this is the case where, uh, can, can somebody tell me which case was this? Okay, is this the case where things are becoming harder, the same or simpler? Okay, so we're saying that epsilon is greater than zero. And so um, your function is actually slightly smaller. So which is this, which case is this? Yeah. Sorry, uh, the lady over here is guess it's getting harder because f of n is actually of a lower power, and so you're breaking up the problem into something more complex. Okay, so in that particular case, you see that all the work is being done right at the leaves. Okay, and the number, the 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 complexity of the leaves can be shown to be given by this expression. Okay, and so um, here's an example. Uh, let's say that a is equal to two, b is equal to four. So you have equation over here where a is equal to two, b is equal to four, okay? Um, sorry, I got that. Yeah, so so the expression, so, um, uh, 
Let me see if I have that right. So first case is, is becoming harder. All the work is being done at the leaves. Okay. So I've taken the case where A is equal to two and B is equal to four. Okay. And so, um, yeah. Okay. So this is, a, this is a tricky question. So this is saying that A is equal to two and B is equal to four, but I'm saying that F of N is, is big O of N to the power zero. In other words, uh, it's constant. Okay. So this is not similar to something that you've already seen. Okay. So in this case, you can see that uh, the uh, f of n, the driving function, is actually uh, n to the power zero, whereas in fact um, the watershed function has log to the base p of a is equal to zero point five. Okay. So you should be able to see that epsilon is actually zero point five in this case. Okay. And so the complexity is going to be theta of n to the power of 0.5. Okay, so let's take a look at another example where I'm not showing you the results, but I want you to figure this out. Can you tell me the answer for this? What's epsilon in this particular case? Epsilon is equal to what? So essentially we've kept A and B to be the same. Now I've changed f of n, the driving function is now 0 0.4, okay? And this is n to the power of 0 0.5 minus epsilon. And uh, what is epsilon in this particular case? Yep, 0 0.1. And does it satisfy the condition? Yes, because epsilon is greater than, so what is the theta value? What is the theta value? Into power 0.5. So it remains the same. So you notice that um, for both of these, uh, f of n, the driving function was as long as it is strictly less than, okay? So f of, uh, epsilon has to be greater than, not greater than equal to zero, but strictly greater than zero. In other words, the driving function has to be strictly of an order of which is uh, has less complexity as compared to the the watershed function, okay? Um, so if epsilon was zero, in other words, if I had order of n to the power 0 0.5, um, case one would not hold, okay? So let's take a look at one more example. I'll be almost out of time, but just let's do this and then we'll stop. So what about this particular case? What is epsilon over here? Sorry? One, yeah. So if epsilon is one, again, the condition is satisfied. And what you'll see essentially, I've shown a whole bunch of examples over here. And all of these are case one. And we'll take a look at it later on as well. Next slide. 